the Holy Sabbath. We ask thee, Lord, that now you will abide with us, for this is your hour. And we ask, Father, that you will be glorified in all that we say and do. Come, Lord, and help us to enter into rest, that we might worship you in the beauty of holiness, and that we might relish every moment that we have to worship thee with reverence in your house and with joy in our hearts and with the peace that passeth all understanding. Now abide with us and give us understanding of the scriptures and may your word be exalted and may Christ be uplifted. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our subject... <coughs> Overthrown at the rising sun. Overthrown at the rising sun. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, he shall enter into the glorious land. Now this morning we discovered that the glorious land is dealing with a land that was provided by God for Protestantism to flourish and where they could keep his laws and reserve, uh, observe his statutes and keep his laws. And that land happens to be the United States. We know that Protestantism in the old world was it provided a land which was called the what? New World, which was later known as the United States. But now, let's go a little bit closer. The Bible goes on and tells us something else. It says, and he shall enter the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. Now, we need to look a little closer at this issue of many. Who are the many that shall be overthrown? And when are they completely overthrown? In the glorious land. We're going to find out. And um, also, I'm going to show you some foot, I'm going to show you some clips of how that overthrow is taking place in t on, one, on two fronts, the turning away from the Bible and the reliance on emotions and miracles. And in some cases, music. We're going to see that. But right now, I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit search of all things, yea, the deep things of God. How many things does the Holy Spirit search? all things, including the deep things of God. The deep things is that word, Greek word bathos, and it means to go beneath the surface, meaning that we cannot be content with surface reading of the scriptures. We must at times examine verses and passages and go deeper into what their meanings are by comparing scripture with scripture. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there little. And in Isaiah 8.20, the Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. With that thought in mind, let's have a word of prayer together. Lord, you said it not, it's not by might, nor is it by power, but it's by my spirit. We ask that the Holy Spirit will abide with us now and that he might guide us into all truth and show us things to come. Give us understanding of the scriptures and make your word a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Because without thee, we can do nothing. Lord, please grant us now thy Holy Spirit and may he now guide us into all truth and may he also show us things to come. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you for hearing our prayer. And we address our prayer to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 
I'd like for you now to turn in your Bibles with me back to Daniel eleven forty one. The Bible says in Daniel eleven forty one. When you get there, just say amen. amen. Notice what the scripture says. He shall enter into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hands, even Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. Our subject right now, overthrown at the rising sun. And so we want to take a look at this together. And let's look at our verse. The Bible says, when he enters the glorious land, what's going to happen? Many shall be overthrown. Now, that means many, who are the many? Let's see from the Bible. Then we can come back and look at exactly who is being overthrown in the glorious land or in, the, or in general. We'll see in a moment. Let's take a look together. Turn me your Bibles for a moment to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. It says, many shall be overthrown. Let's see who are the many. In Matthew chapter 24, looking here at verse 4, Jesus is telling the disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he declares to the disciples that the temple that they so much loved and respected and admired would be thrown down and not one stone would be left upon another. To the disciples, for the temple in Jerusalem to be thrown down, to them it meant the end of the world. And so they came to him privately saying, Lord, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Jesus mercifully blended two things together, the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. He mercifully did that for the disciples because they would be overwhelmed if they had understood it in its proper, in the true light at that time. But now, notice what the Bible says here. It says here, and verse 3, I'll start there, and, when he, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, before we go any further, what did Jesus say what happened to Jerusalem? In verse 2. Look with me. Jesus said unto them, See ye not these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Question, is Jesus just prophesying or is Jesus getting this from somewhere? Is he just having a, having a visual thought of, of, of the future or is he actually getting this from somewhere? How you say he knows the future? But now is Jesus, does Jesus, does, listen carefully. Turn with me in your Bibles. He talks about no one stone which should not be left upon another, it should not be thrown what? Down. Now look at verse 1. Jesus went out and, his disciples, and departed from where? The temple. Where did he depart from, everybody? The temple. And he says here, and the disciples came to show him the buildings of the what? The temple. And Jesus tells his disciples that there should not be one stone left upon another that should not be thrown down. For you to go you to context, watch this. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel 9, and let's look here at verse 27. That's 26 and 20, 26. The Bible says... And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. That's talking about his crucifixion. But not for himself. Now, it's talking about he's going to die for the sins of the world. 
Listen carefully. And now time will go past. Time is involved in these verses. In fact, 40 years of time is involved from the time of the crucifixion to the time of the next reading of this verse. When you read, and the people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Another word for sanctuary is temple. Jesus is describing the destruction that will come on the temple based on the prophecy of the 70 weeks in Daniel. Okay? I want you to just get the picture. So when he tells the disciples, see these stones, it is not just him having a vision only as he looks upon the Mount of Olives and sees destruction, but he also knows from the sure word of prophecy that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And so he's he actually, he's pointing to the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9. So the prophecy of Daniel 9 is connected to the destruction of Jerusalem, and then we move forward to the issues that will take place from that destruction that will lead all the way up to the Great Advent Movement and to the final signs prior to Jesus' return. Is when we look at this in the big picture. But let's go back to Ezekiel, uh, go back to with me to Matthew 24. He says, see that no man, what? Deceive you. Now, what's the main warning that Jesus gives in the last days? That men be careful of what? Deception. Because it will be through deception that men and women will be overthrown. It will be through what, everybody? Deception. Now, with deception comes lies. With deception comes false speaking, false prophesying. With deception comes the lowering or the disregarding of history, of a true event. And sometimes it's mingled. You see, the reason why deception is so deadly is because if truth stood on its own and deception stood on its own, you could clearly distinguish between the two. But in the last days, it's truth versus truth and error combined. This is why in the last days he said, let no man, what? Deceive you. Let's go a little bit closer now and you'll see more. The Bible says here in the next verse, notice verse 20, Matthew 24. Again, let's look at verse 5. And it's, now remember Daniel 11 said what? Many shall be what? Now we're going to get a description of the many. Let's see what they are. Let's look at the background. It says, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall what? Deceive many. Now notice that the many is connected to a political event or a religious affair. Religious affair. But the religious affair is what? Is it pagan religions? No, because the person says, I am Christ. So this is what type of religion? This is Christian religion. So if I were to stop for just a moment, we're going to build on it. You're going to say, many is referring to many Christians. Many Christians will be overthrown as the papacy enters the glorious land. The Protestant or we could say it this way, apostate Protestant Christianity. Because the papacy can never enter true Protestant Christianity. But he can enter apostate Christianity that received the land and is now reneging on its and, and re renouncing God's statutes and his laws that that was the purpose why he gave them the land, just like he gave ancient Israel, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. And now the land that was promised to be an asylum for the people of God has now rejected his statutes and rejecting his law. And then he says, because of that, I will bring a curse upon you and upon your land. And when you go back to the Deuteronomy 28 and you look, at, you look at Leviticus 26 on the issue of curses, the cursing, one of the major curses is terror. Well, 
And if you don't believe that, look at Leviticus 28, 26, 15. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 15. Showing the magnification of God's law, look what it says. It says here, he says, and ye despise, he says here, and he talks about if they don't keep his commandments, listen carefully. And by the way, was, an, was America a place that had a knowledge of God's word and his commandments? How do we know? Remember what the Bible said, he would have, they would have the principles of Jesus in their rise to power? Let's think about it for a moment. What is the principle of Jesus, John 8, 32? And ye shall know the what? Truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, so what is truth? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. So Jesus is truth. Okay, what else is truth right quick? John 16, 13, the Bible said, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is truth. But what else is truth? John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So Jesus and his word are what? Truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. But now what else is true? Psalms 119, 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. So it's Jesus, his word, his commandments, and his spirit, which are all what? Truth. Now wait a minute. The Bible says here, the Bible, the Bible says in Leviticus, if ye will not hearken unto me, verse 14, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye despise my statutes, and if your soul abhor my judgments, that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. Terror? So wait a minute. You mean America is faced with terror because of the rejection of God's law? You mean corruption in high places, in court systems, in law enforcement, and everything else has come as a result of the rejection of God's word, his law, the character of Jesus among Christianity? And is it possible, even among Adventists, who profess to keep the law, but are yet breaking the law, is it possible that we too are brought to a place in this nation with the people to terror? This is something that we don't think about. But then, and then not only that, but with this terror, the Bible foretells something else. The Bible says here, and it says here, over you, then he comma, he says consumption. Now he deals with the diseases that will come on the people in the nation because of their rejection of his law. What is one of them? Consumption. Consumption is what? That's tuberculosis. We call that tuberculosis today. Is tuber do, do many American people suffer from tuberculosis? Many Christians suffer from it? Because of what? what? What is the reason? What is the reason why God said this comes? Because they did what? They, did, they rejected his law and refused to observe his statutes and keep his laws. Listen carefully. I want you to go a little closer. And it says the burning egg. That's like fever. And then it has consumption of the eyes and the cause of sorrow heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain. Meaning your, even your land for growing your food and for growing your crops will all be consumed. Because you've broken my covenant. Now look, in Leviticus 28. I mean, not Leviticus, Deuteronomy 28. Look at here, come on. I want to show you. You see, before you're overthrown, before this country is overthrown by the papacy, this country is overthrown by the rejection first of God's law. If Adventism is overthrown, it's overthrown because of the rejection of God's law while at the same time professing to keep the Sabbath. But the violation of the Sabbath and the violation of his law brings terror or brings judgments upon the people of God 
And what are the judgments for God's people? Disease and sickness. What's the judgments upon the nation? Terror and disease and sickness and judgments of fire, flood, and earthquakes. For the violation of his law. Listen in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Bible said this. I just want you to see. In Deuteronomy 28. Moreover, listen the Bible says here. Okay, and I'm looking at Deuteronomy chapter 28. And let's look here at verse. Um, let me take you here for a moment. Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to do what, everybody? <laughs> to do his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. Now, you let the average preacher tell you, you ask them, does God's law exist today? What's the first thing they say? The law of God is nailed to the cross. We're not under the law. We're under grace. But here, the Bible just made it very plain that if you reject God's law, which is not just a law for ancient Israel or for the Jews, if you reject his Sabbath, which was not for the Jews but for man, for remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, I mean, Matthew 2, Mark 2, 27 to 28, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So watch this. The Sabbath was never for the Jews. The Sabbath was for all mankind, and especially all mankind that claimed to have been Protestant and believed the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now, I just want to make it very plain. But now look a little closer with me. The Bible says here that because of that, because of the rejection of God's law, you are overthrown. Now, get this. When you read in the Bible where God says, I will overturn and I will overturn, the word overturn means to be overthrown. But what causes a nation to be overturned? Does God just arbitrarily overturn the nation? No, the nation is overturned when they reject. When you look at this word overturn correctly, you'll find out the nation or people or person or family or church can be overturned by God when they reject his law. And when the nation is overturned, the curses of the law come upon the nation. I want you to see. So is it possible that in this time, of this time that we're watching, that many of the, the nation, the, the glorious land, America, is being, being overthrown because the nation, God has now allowed the nation to be overturned as a result of their rejection of his law. Has the time come? Is, it, is this why now terror is, on the, uh, is, in the, is, in the, is in America, but also because America is supposed to be a beacon of light to the whole world through Protestant teachings? That means that every nation that also rejects now God's law, who no longer want to follow, who wants to follow America's example, and teaching now what? what what's, what's the major teaching in America? Watch this. Is it, isn't it secular humanism now? And now because of that, we now call evil what? Good, and we call good evil. When a man speaks out against same-sex marriage now, he's charged with a hate crime, or he's charged with, not, with, with, with being uh, indifferent to the, to the whims of society. But at the same time, if a man stands up and says he endorses it, he's praised. We are calling evil good and good evil. And the Lord says, woe be unto them. This indicates that a darkness, a strange darkness is coming over the earth, but also over this country. And it won't be long before God's people enter into a time of trouble like never before. Let me take you one more step, though. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 28, These curses shall overtake thee, and thou, thou wilt be destroyed, because thou hast not hearkened to the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. It says, And they shall be, a sign, and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. 
And so the Bible tells us here what happened. And by the way, why was Jerusalem destroyed? Jerusalem was destroyed because of their rejection of the Messiah. Ellen White says in the book Great Controversy, The Destruction of Jerusalem, she says, the Jews were destroyed because of the rejection of Christ. She said, the great sin of the Jews was their rejection of Christ. The great sin of the Christian world will be their rejection of the law of God. And as a result of rejection of the law of God, terror is come upon a nation that was provide a, 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 a people that had a land flowing with milk and honey. And with that rejection of the law, the door was open for the, develop, for the man of sin to enter this nation. And with that, and the rejection of the law of God, I want to just put one more thing out there so you can get it, and now I want you to remember this. Many of the ministers that openly preach that the law of God was nailed to the cross, many of them are Freemasons. And the ultimate worship of Freemasonry is Lucifer. And Lucifer was the great apostate that rejected the fallen angel who rejected what? The law of God. I want you to just see what's going on. The people of the secret societies and some of the founding fathers who were connected to the secret societies who on the outside appeared to be religious and Christian but who are definitely, of, in a sense, tolerant of Christianity, but at the same time was desiring a new world order where secular humanism would prevail. You often ask the question, why do we have the Statue of Liberty in New York City? What type of liberty did the French really believe in? Did they believe in the liberty that comes by knowing Jesus? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Was that the reason for the Statue of Liberty? No, the Statue of Liberty was the sign of the worship of the goddess of reason, but it was also the worship of the liberty that had, had started the French Revolution, which was a liberty to throw off the restraints of Christianity. I want you to understand, remember Voltaire, and remember Thomas Paine, who wrote the book Age of Reason. Because they worship the goddess of reason. If you still don't believe me, then ask yourself this question. Why is it that all of a sudden same-sex marriage in the last 10 years, five years, have come out the closet and now is um, and it's being globally accepted? Not just in a nation, not just in a little country, but globally is being pushed. Why is this? Because this is the teachings of the French Revolution. You remember? They'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we see it come out the clouds. In Romans 1, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. But became, but their, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. And for this cause, God gave them over to vile affections. And their women did change in natural use, which is against nature, and so also the men. Men with men, women with women, doing that which is unseemly. Receiving in themselves the recompense of reward, which is meat. What are we watching in our society? Terror. The reign of terror is not Islam. Islam is the, is the scapegoat, is the decoy. The real reign of terror is the socialist system of a new world order that's being developed right before your eyes under the pretext and of the same teachings of the French Revolution for the destruction of Christianity and especially fundamental Bible-believing Christianity. This is why Islam and Muslims are being used as the front guard. Oh, we're going to hire more of them, and we're going to let them have control of these communities and all that. Anything but Christianity. This is what you're looking at. 
What, you got confused? You forgot your book? You forgot what you read in Great Controversy? This is deliberate. This is called social engineering. The changing of the society to bring about the new world. Not the world that you want, not the world you and I grew up in, but the new world where no Judeo-Christian belief, fundamental Bible-believing Christianity, will no longer control the society or become the norm or the morals of man. This is what we see taking place. So I want you to understand. So when, but when Jesus says many, he's talking about many in Christianity. And look what the Bible goes on and says, go back with me to Daniel 11. Come on, go back with me now. Let's see this with me. The Bible says here, in Daniel 11, are you there? The Bible says many shall be overthrown, but so far it's going to be many where? In Christianity or in, or in the Christian church, for that matter, or Protestantism, if you want to put it that way. But now go back to Matthew 24 with me again. Let's look a little closer so we can be sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe we are jumping a gun here. Let's take a look again. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall do what? Deceive what? Many. Let's go again. So the Bible says, with this will be what? Deception. Is that right? Let's go a little bit closer. Verse, and let's look at verse 11. And what? Verse 10 says, and verse 9 and 10 says, we'll come back to verse 10. Go to verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall do what? Deceive many. So wait a minute. What's, gonna, what's the major issue here that we see taking place? Deception of the what? Of the many in where? In the church or in Christianity or what we call Protestantism today. Apostate Protestantism today. Look carefully. Let's go a little bit more. The Bible goes on and says here in verse 11, it says, Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And then you go a little closer. What's coming with deception? Look at Matthew 24, verse 24. The Bible says, For there shall arise what now? But how many false Christs, according to what we read earlier? Many false Christs. You put it all together. There shall be many false Christs and many what? False prophets. And shall show what? Great signs and wonders. And if it was possible, they would deceive the very elect. So the Bible is saying that the Bible is showing you who the many are that will be overthrown. But let's go one more step. Go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Let's go there together. Okay? In Matthew chapter 7. And when you get there, just say amen. In Matthew chapter 7, and let's look at verses 21 and 22 to be sure that we understand who the many are. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22, not everyone that saith unto me, what everybody? Lord, Lord. Now who cries, Lord, Lord? Religion. Religion. Christians cry, Lord, Lord. Isn't that right? Not everyone that saith unto me. Who is the me talking about here? It's talking about Jesus. So this is talking about Christianity. This is talking about apostate Christianity. Listen carefully. Apostate Protestantism, if you please. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, what is the will of the Father in heaven? What is his will? The Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the what? Whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is what? The whole duty of man. Look at Psalms 40, verse 8, to go with this. Psalms 40, verse 8. David says what? I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So what is the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven? To love God and to keep his commandments and his law be in your heart as his law is in his heart. Now you say, what do you mean his law in his heart? Remember what the Bible says in Matthew 12, 34. The last part of that verse says, Out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And, then, and, 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 and when we read Exodus chapter 20, what do we read? And God spake. Now let's stop for a moment. And God spake out the abundance of his heart all these words. Hmm? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image of any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. 
For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take of his name in vain. Honor thy father and thy mother. No? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all them in the midst, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so we find here that the, the, for God's will to be done on what? Earth as it is where? In heaven is dealing with his law in our hearts being lived out in our lives that the very law of God, the law of love, through faith and love, we are able to keep the commandments of God. Are you with me now? Because we do it out of what? Love for God. If you love me, Keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Now let's go back for a moment. So we find here that many will be what? Overthrown. But listen a little closer. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many what? Wonderful works. Then I will profess unto them what? I never what? I never knew you. So stop for a moment. So who are the many? Many Christians. Many in Christianity, many in apostate Protestantism will be what now? Overthrown. But now what does it mean to be really overthrown? And what will cause their overthrow as we get down to it now? I want you to see this with me. This is, this is, not, this is, not, real, this is not a real, going to be a long situation, but I just want you to see with me what will be that, what will be that many that will be overthrown. Turn me in your Bibles again now and turn me to the book of Job for a moment. There are two places where God's people are overthrown. How many places, everybody? Two places. Um, yes, okay. Job chapter 19. Turn me to Job chapter 19. Hmm? Job, like J-O-B. If I say, we call it Job, even though in American English we would call it Job, okay? All right, everybody there? In Job chapter 19. And let's look at what it means to be overthrown. Now, I'm going to give you this. Israel was overthrown in two places. Those two places was the wilderness, and the other one was stony places. And I want you to see this with me, first of all. Turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Did I come back to Job? Come on, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. I want to show you where they're overthrown. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Are you there? The Bible says here, it says, but, for, but with many of them, God was not what? God was not what? Well pleased. It says, for they were what? They were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, in, the, in this context, what causes men to be overthrown? Sin. Not, pleasing God. not pleasing God. Sin is the issue, but is not pleasing God. So that means they will do something that will be what? Contrary to what God has declared. Isn't that right? That would be sin. But at the same time, but that sin will be something contrary to what God tells you to do. All right? So the Bible says many were overthrown in the wilderness because God was not what? God was not pleased. But now let's go again with me. And let's see again what the Bible says. Turn me to Psalms 141.6. Psalms 141.6. And let's see again where people, where Israel is overthrown. In Psalms 141.6, the Bible says, and when their judges were what? Overthrown, where? In stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Wait a minute. 
Israel is overthrown where? In the wilderness. But Israel was also overthrown where? In stony places. Now, what does it mean, first of all? Okay, what does it mean when one is, over, when one is overthrown? Let's see what 2 Chronicles 14, 13 says. 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 13. What happens when you're overthrown, okay? Let's see what happens to a group of people that when they were overthrown. 2 Chronicles 14, right? 14, 13. The Bible says here, it says here, but with, with, it says here, I'm sorry. It says here, and Asa, that's there, 2 Chronicles 14, 13, I gave you, right? The Bible says here, and Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gigar. It says here, and it says, and the Ethiopians were what? were overthrown, now mark, mark carefully what happens when one is overthrown, that they could not what? Recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord, and it says before, their, before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. But the Bible said the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they, what happened when they got overthrown? They could not recover. Now what does it mean you can't recover? You can't gain what's lost. You can't rebuild. You cannot have re a, a revival or, or refurbishing or, 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 or re uh, again, like rebuilding of what you lost. It's completely destroyed. Isn't that right? Keep that in mind. I want you to keep that in mind as we continue on. The Bible shows something else, though. Why? What happens when you're overthrown by God? Now, first of all, who overthrown the Ethiopians? The Lord allowed them to be overthrown. Is that right? So when God allows you to be overthrown, when God allows a people or a person or a nation or a church to be overthrown, it will be because of what? Because of transgression of his what? Of his law and without the people ever coming to what? Repentance and a changing or a reconverting back to obedience to God. When he sees that the people are going too far, there comes a time, you know you hear people say, you can go out there and sin and you can go too far? There is a point where you can go too far in sin. You can indulge one time too many. You can continue to take God for granted and trifle on his mercies and you will go too far. And when you do, God will withdraw his spirit from you and leave you to the idol that you love to the point that you will be overthrown by your rejection of his law, by transgression of it, and by going against his character, which was revealed in his will, which was connected to his law. I want you to just see with me. Now let's go a little bit closer and you'll see more with me. Look what the Bible says in Job chapter 19. Let's go to Job 19. We're going to find out what happens when you're overthrown. Job chapter 19. Let's go back there now. Are you there? In Job chapter 19, notice what the Bible says here. In Job chapter 19, and I want you to look here with me for a moment at verse uh, 6. Look carefully. In Job 19, 6, it says, Know now that God has what? God has overthrown me. Now, why would God, how is it that God can overthrow you? And we're not dealing with just a nation first. Let's deal with individual. When are you and I overthrown? When we turn aside from God, when we continue in iniquity and transgression, then the Bible says we are what? Overthrown. And listen to what Dave, listen to what Job said. For God has what? Know now that God has overthrown me and has compassed me with his what? With his net. Now I want you to look here at verse 9, first of all. What happens when you're overthrown? The Bible said, he has stripped me of my what? Glory. Now what is glory dealing with? He has stripped me of his glory. Who has a message on glory? Did you know that not only, did you know that not only individuals but churches can be overthrown? But now what's going to happen when you're overthrown? The first thing that happens to an individual or to a church or to a nation is that they're stripped of their what? Glory. What is the glory? The glory is the character. 
meaning that they will lose because, they, because of their transgression, God withdraws his spirit and they're stripped of the image of God being recreated in them because of their choosing to walk in disobedience and transgression. I want you to see what's going to happen. This was it. He's, look what it says. He has stripped me of my glory and has taken the crown from my head. Wait a minute. What's the crown? What crown do you and I have? You have a crown coming? You remember anything about a crown in the Bible? What crown do you and I have? Remember, Christ in you, Christ in me is the hope of but if you're stripped of the glory, that means you're stripped from the Holy, the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn from you and it's impossible for you to develop his glory, his character. And because of that, then the crown is taken from you. What crown? First Timothy, uh, what was that? First Timothy 4, 6, I'm thinking about where it says here what? Okay, where is it at? Is that 4? Second, second Timothy 4, 8. The Bible says here, 2 Timothy 4, 8, verse 7 and 8. Watch this. Watch this. It says here, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. Henceforth for me is laid up a crown of what? Righteous. Righteousness. Whom the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day. But not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. But in order for you to love the appearing, you must have the glory. But if you're stripped of the glory, then you will not love his appearing because you have been overthrown. Are you with me now? And so the Bible is showing that most of Christianity is going to be stripped of the glory of God and the crown of life taken from them be just prior to Jesus' return. Because they're going to follow and be led into transgression against God's law, they will have gone too far. Most of Adventism is going to be stripped of the glory and they're going to fail to develop the character that they heard about that was preached to them in the first, second, and third angel's messages because they have gone too far in transgression to adoption of liberal ideas and the lowering of standards and the disregard of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Many Adventists have gone too far and many leaders have led them astray like Aaron of old who saw a golden calf just come up out out of the out of the pot out of the mold that they made pa oh Moses this calf just came up they made the calf they developed the calf and they gave the gold that the calf was made from and in Adventism many are about to be overthrown long before the king of the north the papacy enters and really does we've been infiltrated that has already happened along with every other Protestant church but long before that we have been overthrown because we have rejected God's law we have said his statutes do not mean anything anymore we have said we don't need standards anymore we don't want doctrine anymore all this tell us about the love of God the heathen nations can do that with their gods God God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. God said, if you love me, then serve me with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and don't turn aside from me. Amen. That's what he told us. But we don't believe that, and so as a result, we're going to be overthrown. If we're not careful, in, in, in this nation, the Protestant nation that God set as asylum for, the, for, for all his people is also being overthrown. It's amazing that the nation is being overthrown. And while the nation is being overthrown, God's remnant people are being overthrown at the same time. It's amazing. Now we're calling truth error and error truth. Now we're taking words of God and trying to stretch it to even, to even sit down and justify women's ordination. How can you justify something that God never sanctioned? I don't care how many stories you tell me or how many, how many Bible stories you read about women. The Bible gives the context of what, how, what that woman did in her fear of God, but never in the scriptures did the scriptures warrant her being ordained to be the leader over the church. Now the Bible is clear, but if you say that this is not so because times have changed, then I guess the Sabbath has changed too then because it did get changed from Sabbath to Sunday. And if so, most of the world today is worshiping on Sunday. So why are you telling me to keep the Sabbath? 
Because two institutions came out of Eden, the Sabbath and marriage. And now you're destroying the marriage when you start saying that the woman is the head. That she can be head of the church. Now, no offense on the women. I hope you understand that. I'm not a male chauvinist if you want to talk like that. But I'm just talking about the truth of what the word of God says. We know women do ten times better missionary work than men. Ellen White tells you that right there in the Bible, right there in the Spirit of Prophecy. She tells you that when it comes down to missionary work, women got you beat 100%. So no matter how good we preach, the women got us. But they have their sphere of labor and missionary work as men have their sphere of labor in the work of God, in pastoring and in missionary work as well. Does that mean we belittle the women and make them feel like they're nothing? No. But it does mean that they have a sphere of labor and influence that men cannot equal. As men have a sphere of labor and influence that the women cannot equal. God, holy, they said, well, the Holy Spirit can use anybody. Let me just say this to you. The Holy Spirit can use anybody, but the Holy Spirit will never supersede the written word of God. Let's make it plain. And one of the biggest mistakes we ever made, and we endorsed and we went along with it, like, like, little, like people who are mindless, is when we let women elders come on the scene. If we had stopped that, we wouldn't be in the situation we're into now. But we let that go by, and now we want to know why all of a sudden we got this women ordination going on with, or in the church. And let me just say this to you. If we were in another church, if we were in some other settings, and some of our laymen had done some of the things that some of these pastors have done, we would be put to a board meeting and put out the church for or going against the general conference. We get put in board meetings and get put out the church for going against the pastor. You have, cold con you have conferences that have went against the policy that the general conference had when they asked them to wait. And they were not, and then you, you, they've been, what, pat on the hand, tried it? But, if you, but regular church members, the moment they speak out against truth, or the moment they make a stand, they get a board meeting, and they're ready to write your name off and send you, up, send you to the pastor. And put you out the church, and then say, well, you know, we had a meeting, and we decided that, you know, you can no longer be a member of this church as long as you hold that position. What should be happening to preachers who are leading the people to go against the Bible and who are taking the scriptures to bend them to make them found so fanciful for the acceptance of women ordination then? Because once we embrace this, we will also embrace the gay aspect of the issue of gay. And let me tell you why we're going to embrace it, because let me tell you this right now. When you are 501c3, ladies and gentlemen, you are a corporation. When you saw the Adventist church go to court over, the, over Rafael Perez a few years ago and others, you, we went to church and it was a corporation suing another corporation because Perez happened to have been 501c3 at the time himself. And when you're 501c3, you lose all constitutional rights. You walk in the courtroom and say, Your Honor, I believe, I'm taking, I, I believe in the Constitution and I want to stand on the amendment that, you know, Congress should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or, or religion or the free exercise of it, and we have the right to worship. And the judge look at you and say, Mrs. So-and-so, are you, or Mr. So-and-so, are you 501c3? And you say, yes. And then he sits around and said to you, well, first of all, did you, did you know that when you become 501c3, you have lost all constitutional rights, that you are not under the Constitution, but that you are under maritime law? Please sit down and say another word about the Constitution before I hold you in contempt of court. And why did we take 501c3? Because you want to coerce, because you want the people to get a tax-deductible receipt for paying their tithe? Since when did God tell you to pay tithe to get a tax-deductible receipt? We don't want to hear that. Oh, prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts. How much proving are you doing? How much faith you got when you know when you pay your tithe at the end of the year? I'm going to get my receipt back. I'll get it all back. No, you show me where you're supposed to pay it like that. 
And remember, in the early history of America, the churches were tax exempt anyway. And under maritime law, the judge has the final say. The court controls. And because you're 501c3 and the conference is 501c3, when you go into the meeting, you have already lost already. Because you're a corporation, so another corporation. You don't believe it? Go back and check the record. It's in the law. We are, and we're saying, but, but, but wait a minute. What, what happened to your faith in God? To believe that if you had to, he will do it. Why are the churches going to accept homosexuality in the churches? Why are the pastors in first day churches and other churches changing their mind? Because of 501c3. And let me tell you something. Why is Adventists going to change? Because of 501c3. Because you, on the 501c3, you are given rights by the sovereign who has given you that privilege. And the sovereign who's given you that privilege is the government of the United States. And that means you must obey what the government brings, whatever laws the government has. That's why when you're 501c3, you cannot take a political stand on anything. But you don't believe it. But at the same time, now this government has said, we are, we are saying that homosexuality is okay. So your church is going to say, no, we're not going to believe that. We're going to stand up against it and preach the word of God. Oh, really? You're going you're gonna to quote Romans 1 to them, right? You're going to turn back around and show them Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Well, how long do you think you're going to get away with that? When the laws really come down and they say either you desist or you will cease to exist as a church. But we don't want to go there because most of our self-supporting institutions, all of us, are connected to this because we did it because, well, you know, people don't want to give unless they can get a tax of a receipt. Well, the, the people got a wrong education about tithing in their minds in the first place, and they need to change that right away. And at the same time, you and I are going to be incriminated if we sit here and talk about we're, not going, to, we're going to preach against the what? You're going to preach the third angel's message? Not if you remain under that system. Now, you don't have to believe me. Don't believe nothing I just said. Go home, go back and do your own homework. And you begin to understand why many will be overthrown. This thing is good. This thing is become, this thing is getting ready to get very serious with us. And many of us don't want it. And many of our, many, many in self-supporting don't want to hear it either. Because, oh man, you know, we, we're safe. Are you? Your only safety is walking, by, walking with God by faith. Your only safety is making sure that you, have, you are walking and doing everything according to the way God said do it. And that you, if you necessary, every earthly support can be cut off. But God said, I will take care of you. Amen. But it's based on your faith that's going to happen. And we are watching things happen. We want to know why, 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 what, what type of dilemma are we in? We are in for, we're in for a major shock, most of us, if we're not careful. Listen, in Job 19.10, look what else the Bible says happens when you're, when you're overthrown. In Job chapter 19, verse 10, the Bible tells you again. Look what it says here. In Job 19.10, he has destroyed me on every side. I am gone. My hope has what? Have he removed like a what? Tree, what, where do you get hope from? Where do you get hope from? What, what does the Bible say about hope? Faith. Now, faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for, the everything not seen. So when your hope is destroyed, your faith is destroyed, meaning you will lose your faith and belief in the Bible and in the promises of God. Listen a little closer. Come on, what it means to be overthrown. So when these people are overthrown, they will have no more hope in the Bible. They will fall, go along with whatever the system says. Listen carefully. The Bible says here in Job 19, 11, look what else it says here. He has also kindled his what? Wrath. Now, wait a minute. What is the wrath of God? He said he's kindled his wrath. What is the wrath of God? The Bible says in Revelation 14, 9, 
And, I, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead and his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The Bible says that we are being overthrown because the people will have yielded to the mark of the beast. And as they yield to the mark of the beast, the Bible said they are overthrown and their hope is gone and their Holy Spirit has been withdrawn from them and their enemies can pass them about. Now, once you get the picture, look what the Bible goes on and says here. Look at verse 18. Watch what it says here when you're overthrown. And here it goes again. In Jer and, I'm sorry, not verse 18. Look at verse, uh, verse 11. We said here, he has kindled his wrath against me, and he has counted me what? Unto he, I, and he has counted me unto him as one of his what? When will God count you or me as an enemy? When we're what? When we yield our understanding of the commandments of God to the mark of the beast, to the image of the beast, to the union of church and state. When we do this under the political pressure, when we do this under the 501c3 pressure, when we do this under the worldly influence pressure, when we do this, the Bible says, God says, I will count you as an enemy. Just want you to see. Now let's go one more step. The Bible said you're going to be overthrown. But now I told you the people of God were overthrown in the wilderness, but they're also overthrown someplace else. Where are they else overthrown? I said in stony places. What do stony places refer to? First of all, turn me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, I want to show you what's going to happen. How do we know? What, what is this overthrown connected with? I'm going to show you something. In Matthew chapter 24, looking at verse 9, the Bible says here, And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. And ye shall be, and ye shall be, and they shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my what? My namesake. Name deals with character and law. And in the law of God is the seal of the fourth commandment. And so the Bible said in the last days, those who have the seal of God will be hated of all nations for his namesake. Why? What have the nations done? Turn me to Psalms 95, 6. Psalms 95, 6. Let's see what the nations have done. Look what the Bible says in Psalms 95, 6. Are you there? In Psalms chapter 95, verse 6, look what the Bible says here. I want you to get this. In Psalms 95, 6, the Bible says here, oh, I'm sorry, verse, um, I mean, it's not verse 6 I want. It's going to be here, 95, yes, I know it's Psalms 95, but is it 5, wait a minute, which one is that? The gods of the nations are idols. Which one is that? Um... Which one is that? Right here. Um, turn with me. Let's go look further down here with me for a moment. 96.5. 96, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Holy Spirit, bringing it to the, my sister's mind. Look here. Psalms 96.5. For all the gods of the what? For all the gods of the nations are what? Idols. Idols. But the Lord made what? Heaven and earth. So wait a minute. The gods of the nations are what? Idols. Do you remember a king who made an idol? What was his name? Nebuchadnezzar. And what was the idol of his nation? A golden what? Image. Is that right? A golden image. And the Bible says, now when that image was made, only some of the Bible says, everybody bowed down and worshiped the what? The image, but what? Three men. The three men represents Shadrach, it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Which was, which, whose real name was Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. But now get this. What did they represent? The image of the beast or the image of the nation of Babylon was the golden idol of Nebuchadnezzar. But the three Hebrew men who refused to bow down was a symbol of God's people who will be preaching the three angels' messages warning about the image of of the beast, his worship, and his mark. And when the time comes for it to be instituted, those who are faithful to the truth of God and who love the truth more than life itself will stand and say, be it known unto thee, or be it known unto thee, O nations of a new world order. We will not, by the God we serve is able to deliver us. 
But if he will not, we will not worship nor bow down and serve the golden image or the great new world order image of Sunday that you have invoked. This is what we get ready to see. We're heading into this time. I want you to see a little closer. But now look what else the Bible says. The overthrown in stony places. Turn to me to Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, the Bible puts it this way. And many shall be what? Many is going to be what? Offended. Now, wait a minute. Who's offended? Now, in the context, you were hated of all nations for his what? Namesake. And if you were to study Matthew 24 early on, you would find it was kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, showing that the kingdoms and the nations were divided. And then early on, you saw Christians deceiving Christians. And both of these things were going on simultaneously. Deception is what also leads to war. Did you know that? Deception was taken in heaven and it led to a war with one third of the angels being cast out, taken out with the great red dragon, Satan himself. And so wars are usually based also on deception. Could it be that we're in a war in Iraq or in Iran that was actually started on, dece on deception? Could it be that some of the things that we've been watching and we've been hearing on the news is actually not the truth? Could it be that we are actually in this issue of a terroristic situation because we, we are heard that it was dealing with terror when in reality it's been a deception? And could it be that while we're worried about the Muslims prospering in the community, is that also connected to the deception? To create more fear and terror worldwide while you look at them while the real issue is a world world government and a social order that's coming on that's going to be worse than anything any muslim could ever come up with because they also will become the victims of this world order when it's time to cancel them out i want you to understand what's going to happen look a little closer though the bible says you should be hated of all nations but then it says here and many shall be what so the bible said the time is coming when the many in Christianity, but in this case, the many are in the Adventist church. You say, what do you mean the Adventist church? Remember it said you'd be hated of his name? Name deals with character and what? Law. Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. God's name, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant, goods and truth. And then when you go further down, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sins, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Wait a minute. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, what's that? That's the law. So the character of God and his law are one. But that character and his law is his name. So you're going to be hated for his name. But in his law is the fourth commandment, which carries his name, title, and territory. And the fourth commandment contains the seal of God. Therefore, you are hated of all nations because you maintain God's law, his Sabbath. Therefore, you have his seal. And because of that, you are hated of all nations and they will seek to kill you. This is what the Bible is bringing up. Look a little closer with me now. It says, and when that happens, many that are in the church, in the so-called remnant church of God, the structure that you want to call that, even in self-supporting circles as well, because you think everybody's here, everybody's on the same page, everybody's not on the same page, especially when persecution comes. You're going to find out who's on the same page. Some people are going to say, well, you know, I was with this thing until, you know, <laughs> you know I was with y'all, you know, but right now, hey, God bless you. <laughs> I talk to you, I'm out of here. Okay, look what's going to happen. I want you to see what's going to happen. Look what the Bible says here. Then it says here, they show what? Then shall many be offended and do what? And show what? Betray one another. It says, and shall hate one another. What did the Bible say the people's attitude will be? Those who are not under the seal of God at the time when this issue comes. Now, what's going to bring on this issue of this hatred? The Bible says here in verse 6, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See, ye be not troubled, because for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. But notice very carefully, there shall be what? Famines, pestilence, earthquakes. What's that called? Natural disasters, or a crisis of natural disasters, which will bring you to the forefront. As the people of the nations call upon their idols, now, an idol is also called an abomination in Scripture. What is the great abomination? 
Turn me in your Bibles. Come on, turn me there. I want you to see it. I'm going to show you twice so you can get it. And, I, and, and turn me to Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16. For time's sake, I know I can't read all of it. I'm just going to read it, get right to the verse. It says, he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And there the temple of the Lord. Now, by the way, verse 15 says, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn ye yet again, thou shalt see what? Greater abominations than these. So what can be greater than the worship of Tammuz? What can be greater than worshiping four-footed beasts and imagery? The Bible says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were five and twenty men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their face towards the east, and they worshiped the sun towards the what? The east. Wait a minute. What is the greatest of the abominations? Sun worship. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24? You see, Matthew 24 is not in chronological order. So you have to put, you got, you got to put the events together in order to put it correctly. What did Jesus say? Ye shall be what? Hated of all nations for my name's sake, right? But what's going to lead to your hatred of all nations? Because there's going to be something that's going to be set up. When ye shall therefore see, in Matthew 24, 15, the abomination that make of what? Desolate, set up. What's an abomination? An idol. The Jews, in their day, the abomination was the sun, the, the, the great Roman eagle and the, and the reef, which represented the sunburst, that was on their standard when they stuck it on holy ground, a few furloughs outside the walls of Jerusalem. Ellen White called it the standard, but when you look it up, that standard was a golden eagle with the reef, which represents the sun. And therefore, the sun was an abom the worship of the eagle, which was representative of the phoenix, and which represented, was a representative of the sun, and the reef, which was representative of the sun, was an abomination. What's interesting about it, though, they put it on that holy ground. That holy ground that was some time, some four outside Jerusalem was later was called Golgotha. Before that, it was known as Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham offered Isaac and where Solomon had built the temple. And now that place was now known as Calvary, where Jesus had died. And now the Roman soldiers are surrounding Jerusalem, and they put this standard on that holy ground. When they put that standard on the holy ground, now the disciples see the sign, the abomination that make it what? Desolate. The abomination is the sun worship of the Roman gods of Mithra and everyone that they worship, the golden eagle and the reef. But the desolation is the Roman army that is surrounding Jerusalem because they will bring the destruction upon the city and the temple. And see ye these stones? I say unto you, there shall not be one stone left here that shall not be thrown down. This is what he's talking about. So now Jesus said, in the last days, you will see it again, because many in the church are going to get offended as we get down to the issue through the natural disasters that's going to come about a time when the churches, religious leaders, and political leaders are going to no longer be separate. They're going to join together. And then the Bible said, because of natural disasters, they will come together. And when you continue to contend that you're going to keep God's commandments and his Sabbath, then they will join together to deliver you up. And while delivering you up, many in the church will become offended. Many a person who you now eat with, who you now talk to, who are not rooted and grounded in this faith, but who don't mind coming to church because they are stony, they are on stony ground. What is stony ground as we close? Look here at Matthew chapter 24. I want to show you what stony ground is. Matthew 24, are you there? I want you to notice what stony ground is here. Ma not, not Matthew 20, Matthew 13. Go to Matthew 13 with me, a few chapters back, and let's see what stony ground represents. The Bible says here, and I want you to get this very carefully. Remember, our subject was overthrown at, sun, at the rising sun. Look what the Bible says here. The Bible says here in Psalm verse 5, Matthew 13, 5, it says, And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of what? Earth. They had no what, everybody? Deepness of earth. Now, what happened? When it sprung up, talking about the sower who sowed the seed, and this seed fell on stony ground. Remember, Israel was overthrown in stony places. Let's see what stony place or stony ground really is in, in our time and in our terminology. Listen carefully. And when the sun was up, when what, everybody? When the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. They had no what? No root. They withered away. Now, let's go a little bit closer. In the book of Luke, when you study it, Luke says that they had no moisture. 
And because they had no moisture, they withered away. So keep that in mind. But go back with me now to Matthew chapter 13 for a moment. And let's look at verse 20. It says, what is a stony ground place? Listen carefully, stony places. He said, he that receiveth the seed in stony places, the same is he who that heareth the word, and anon with joy receive it. Stop right there. What, wait a minute, who is stony place? What's stony places? People who hear the word of God and they rejoice in the message. Oh, man, I'm so glad to be in Adventist church. I'm so glad I know this three angels message. They're rejoicing in it. They're glad. They, the Bible said they are in the church. They have accepted Christ. The Bible said they're officers in the church. They're preachers in the church. They're church members who seem to be rejoicing. They pick up their hymns. They sing the songs of Zion. Oh, praise God in it. But what happens to them? What did the Bible say happened? Listen what it said. Look what it says here. It says here, yet he did, he hath not what? Root. They're not rooted and grounded. But what does rooted and grounded mean, first of all? Let's see what's going on with these people. Do me, if you keep your finger in Matthew 13 and go with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Let's see what root they don't have. Let's see something. We're going to see something here. Let's see. Are you there? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says here, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by what, everybody? Faith. Being what? Being what? Be, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye may be rooted and grounded in what? Love. You wait a minute. You mean to tell me these people have been in the church for 30 years, 40 years, 10 years, and they knew all the doctrines. They understood the issues of the mark of the beast. They had an understanding of Bible prophecy. They sat in meetings with Doug Batchelor, Kenneth Cox, Stephen Bohr. They heard Walter Fife. They heard everything. And yet at the same time, they had no root. They were not rooted and grounded in love. They lacked moisture. What is moisture in the Bible? Moisture deals with water. Water deals with rain. They receive no early and latter rain. Therefore, when the sun came up, they were scorched by the heat. What does the sun bring? Heat. But what is heat? He deals with trials and tribulations that come as a result of you being hated of all nations for his name's sake. Beloved, think it not strange when some fiery trial come upon you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. Huh? That the trial of your faith being more precious than gold, though it be tried by fire. The trial of your what? Faith. What faith? Faith, oh, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. That's what it is, right? No, your faith in the truth, your faith in the Word of God. For you see, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But every day that you neglect to study the Bible, you have that much less faith. And every time trials come and you're not able to go to the promises of God, you are not able to stand on the word of God. You are not able to ask God to give you power to continue on in his word and you start to capitulate. It demonstrates that you have no real faith in the word of God. You're not rooted and grounded in the love of the truth. And as a result, when the trials come, when the tribulations come, when it, when it gets too overwhelming, you're ready to capitulate. Jesus said, Jesus said that he was no, they had no root. But root means no moisture. They had no deepness of earth. They were surface dwellers. They didn't really study the Bible and they really didn't lay the word of God up in their heart and they didn't live by every word that proceeded out the mouth of God. They didn't know what it meant to depend on God. And now they've come to this point when trial has come because the Bible said the sun was up. Well, what do you mean the sun was up? They said the sun brings heat, but heat deals with trials and tribulation. But when would the trial and tribulation come? When the sun was up. Well, what does it mean for the sun to come up? When will the sun come up? Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark, Mark chapter 16. Let's take a look at that together. Mark 16, verses 1 and 2. Look at it to get me now. You there? Mark 16, verses 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary of Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, it says, had brought sweet spices 
that they might come and anoint him. Well, what, 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 what already passed? The Sabbath. Keep that in mind. So the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. Is that right? But look at verse 2 now. And very early in the morning. You know, it says the first day of the what? The week. They came to the supplica at the rising of the sun. Wait a minute. When is the sun to rise? Oh, when does the sun rise here? On the first day of the week. What do you call the first day of the week today? Sunday. So when Sunday law passes in this country, many will be overthrown. You see, you use this passage to show that Jesus resurrected before the sun rose. But this passage also shows you, when you study it in connection with sun rising, that the sun rising here is the rising of the first day of the week as a national day of rest. With the, with the, with the parable of Matthew 13. The sun is about to rise. And when the sun rises, if you don't have, if you're not rooted and grounded in love, you're going to be scorched by the heat. What do you mean? No moisture was representing the Holy Spirit. Remember in Romans 5, 5, and hope maketh not ashamed. For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So what does it mean when the sun rises? You don't have early or latter rain. Therefore, you cannot stand when the mark of the beast shall be enforced and you will capitulate and join the ranks of the enemy and become one of our worst apostates and opposers of the very truth that you now say you believe. This what happens at the rising of the sun. This is what happens when the papacy is finally finishing, entering. And this afternoon we'll look at how she's entered and we'll see some more how the papacy has actually entered Jerusalem. Or in this case, how she's entered America and all of Protestantism. From the old world to the new world. Brothers and sisters, are you about to be overthrown? Is the sun rising? Do you see Sunday in the distance? Like you see a sun coming up in the morning? Do you see Sunday coming up? You see a pope pushing. You see the pope having a beatification for John Paul II and, another, and the other pope. And at the same time of this beatification that was seen worldwide, they sung a song to Lucifer. And most of the people were watching it, not realizing that the song that the young man was singing was a song for, to Lucifer. We'll see, we'll look more at that later. And understanding that this is connected to all the issues, this issue is connected to the issue of Sunday law, but the one world government. And for the first time, if you study, if you know anything about Vatican history, remember this. It was never meant for a Jesuit to become a pope. Because when a Jesuit becomes a pope, he has no confessor. You go back and read the book Vatican Assassins. What's that mean? It means that, you see, because the pope, the white pope has a confessor. His confessor is a Jesuit general. But if a Jesuit general becomes a pope, where is his confessor? He has absolute power. You don't understand what you're looking at. God is trying his best to help his people wake up before it's too late. Read Vatican Assassins, pages 80 to 90, and read about that, and read about where it says Jesuits are not to become popes. And the reason why. But this afternoon, we'll study more. But I want you to see, many will be overthrown. 
And when this overthrown happens, something else happened in heaven. And we're going to see what that is this afternoon. But my time is up because I got to get you to get, let you eat. But at this time, how many want to say, Lord, I'm not ready. Even though I'm, I'm preaching to you, I see my own soul. Uh, Lord, I, 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 I say it to myself, let it come. But the Bible says, no man think he stand lest he fall. And so in reality, I said, Lord, remove this self-confident spirit. It's better for me to say I'm not ready. And so I made, I've come to that point. I said, Lord, I'm not ready. But help me to be ready. And help me not have any reliance on what I can do. Anybody like that this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have told us how many will be overthrown. Many of your people do not see where their feet are treading. But Lord, in mercy, we ask that you will have mercy and that many will be awakened. Before they're overthrown at the rising of the sun, Lord, we pray that none of us in this room, when the first day of the week rises, when the sun is roused and the world is embracing the first day of the week as they embraced same-sex marriage, we pray that we will not yield and be overthrown. Lord, please help us be ready for the close of probation or the withdrawal of your Holy Spirit from many Adventists who had light, privileges, and opportunity. For a crisis must come that will truly reveal what character we have developed. Please, Lord, have mercy on us. Please help us not to be overthrown but help us to be rooted and grounded in faith and love filled with thy Holy Spirit. We thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.